You're listening to Coog Radio. Listen live online at coogradio.org. What is going on, everyone? Happy Thursday. Welcome back to another episode of Sports Takes with Dom. I'm your host, Dominic Persinger, live with Coog Radio. So today is April 6th, and I have a 10-fight UFC breakdown episode for you guys. So this weekend is UFC 287, the highly anticipated rematch between current middleweight champ Alex Poten Pereira and Israel, the last style bender Adesanya, taking place in Miami, Florida for the first time since 2003. So that's awesome. First time in 20 years the UFC has been in Miami. So first of all, I'll give you guys uh, the full prediction for the four main prelims. And then there's four early prelims, but I'm just going to give you guys one of the early uh, four prelims, just the, my top early prelim. Then I'll break down the entire UFC 287 pay-per-view 5-5 five, five main card for you guys. And last but not least, I'll end the show with some news of the day. So uh, I'll only be breaking down uh, one early prelim for you guys. It's just my top early prelim out of the four. So starting out with a catchweight 160-pound fight. So usually this would be 155, but it's on a short notice with uh, Trey Ogden and uh, Ignacio Bahamandas. I love Ignacio. He's from Chile. He's, I think he's the only current UFC fighter from Chile, so that's really exciting. Uh, I think I watched him fight once last year in February, and he hasn't fought since. I heard he had visa issues, and that's why he hasn't fought, because I mean, he's only 25 years old, and there's not really a reason to you know, go a year without fighting when you're in the middle of your prime. I mean, actually, I'm not even in your prime yet, but he still has so much youth to where he should be fighting you know, two, three times a year. But anyway, yeah, Ignacio, he's 13-4, and 2-1 and one in the UFC, and he's coming off the... Uh, back-to-back third round uh, finishes. The first was over Roosevelt Roberts. He had a nasty uh, spinning wheel kick at the end of the third round. There was about a minute left in the fight. And then he had the third round submission over Zhu Rong uh, in last February. Like I said, that's the fight I've watched live. And uh, like I said, Ignacio's only 25 years old, so he's still super young for the division. He's also the tallest uh, lightweight in the UFC. Or he's tied with a few others, but he stands 6'3", which is huge for the lightweight 155-pound division. And he has a lengthy 76-inch reach. So, uh, yeah, Ignacio has fantastic leg kicks. Uh, I mean, he has incredible output. I mean, he has really shockingly high output for, you know, for being 6'3 in the division. He has pretty underrated grappling. Uh, he's super good all around. Uh, his, his takedown defense is a little... or Sorry, his takedown offense is a little bit questionable, but it shouldn't matter because I think he can win almost kind of anywhere in most fights versus the lower-level competition lightweight, in the lightweight division. So then Trey Ogden, on the other hand, uh, he's 16-5, and 1-1 one one in the UFC, uh, and he's coming off the upset unanimous win over, uh, it, was, it was a decision win over Daniel Zellhuber, where Zellhuber was the a large favorite in that fight, and Ogden just kind of like minimized everything. Zellhuber had like no output throughout the whole fight. It was insane, because before that fight, Ogden lost to Jordan Levitt on the feet, and Jordan Levitt's not known as a boxer in the UFC. So yeah, uh, Ogden's 33 years old, so he's definitely a little bit older than Ignacio, and he's 5'11", so he'll definitely be shorter, and has a 72-inch reach, so he'll also have that, you know, that reach disadvantage here. And Ogden's strictly a grappler, and that's why I was kind of shocked in his last fight that he outboxed a boxer as being only a grappler, but whatever. Uh, he has zero knockouts and 11 submissions, so yeah, he's purely just a grappler. Uh, he has been submitted three times, so it sounds like he spends a lot of times on the mat. He hasn't been knocked out, which is huge, but it just sounds like he's wrestling you know, a lot of guys, and he's either submitting or getting submitted, or he's winning by decision. Uh, yeah, he lacks power in his hands. Uh, he has okay output. I mean, not nearly the amount as uh, Ignacio, which is kind of saying something, considering he's smaller than Ignacio and should have the higher output, but he doesn't. And yeah, he just mainly thrives off you know that chain offensive wrestling, you know, just shooting takedowns. He knows he's not like like he knows his boxing isn't a strong suit, and he obviously poses a submission threat, of course, because of his uh, submission uh, background. Uh, he did look better in the boxing, like I said in his last fight, considering he outboxed the boxer, which was so surprising. But uh, we, like I said, we can't forget he lost to Jordan Leverett in his first UFC fight. That's not a that's not a good loss. So uh, how I see this fight playing out, I see Ignacio dominating wherever this fight goes. Honestly, I think. There's a reason he's a big favorite in this fight. Like, I think he I think he does what he needs to do to avoid getting taken down by Ogden. I mean, maybe he does get a couple times get taken down, but hopefully he gets right back up. Uh, because I I could see a scenario where maybe he does get taken down and get stuck there, which would be the one scenario where Ogden wins this fight. 
I just don't see that as likely as Ignacio dominating in the other areas. And yeah, it's like this is a catch weight fight. So I mean that should benefit Ignacio because he's I mean, he's a bigger guy at 6'3. So adding on that five pounds. I know it's only a little bit, but that five pounds will make a difference and it'll benefit Ignacio's larger frame more. I mean, Ogden is tough, so I don't necessarily see him getting put away here, you know, knocked out or uh, like submitted early. Uh, I think it'll be a close fight, but Ignacio will probably always be the better striker in this fight, just with that reach advantage as well. And uh, Ignacio also has like a sneaky submission game. You know, he had a, I believe he had a Darce choke in his last fight. It was a Darce choke or Anaconda. It was, it was a sneaky submission right over the head. But yeah, uh, I think Ignacio here, because like I've said, he's, he's had guillotines and Darce chokes in the past. He's obviously he needed to pull guard for those chokes. I think he needs to avoid pulling guard here for those, you know, those guillotines and stuff. Because there's a chance if he pulls guard, you know, he doesn't get that submission. Then Ogden's on top of him and he's just dominating him in the wrestling. You know, you don't want to go for some risky submission threat or sorry, attempt. And then end up with the guy on top of you and you end up losing the round. That's how you end up losing the fight. So yeah, I, I mean, I see Ignacio outboxing Ogden for the first couple rounds in like a pretty competitive fight. But I, I like Ignacio here by like a, like a late round knockout. It's hard because like Auden's never been finished. So I, I think it's more likely to be like a 29-28 decision. Unanimous decision for uh, Ignacio Bahamondes. That's what I'm going with here. Now moving on to the four uh, free prelims at 5 o'clock Pacific on ESPN. So this will be on cable. And they're obviously free, which is awesome. So we got a heavyweight 165-pound fight starting off the prelims. We got Carl Williams taking on the UFC... Cornball legend, Chase Sherman. This, this guy's just a whole story. I'll get in him in a second. So first we have Williams. Williams is 8-1. 1-0 in the UFC. I think he only fought about less than a month ago. So, I mean, he's coming back right, right around pretty quick. And he has only three knockouts in his eight fights. So he's very much like a, he, he's a point fighter and tries to get control time. He's not known for being a finisher. Not saying he can't finish a fight, but... Just only having three knockouts in the heavyweight division with eight uh, eight wins. You're definitely not a finisher. But yeah, he's come out with the decision win over Lucas Presky less than a month ago. And he had the impressive contender series win over Jimmy Lawson, a former Penn State wrestler. And I think that was just a big deal. He out-wrestled, out-wrestled the impressive college wrestler. And yeah, he, he lacks power, but he has an impressive wrestling background himself. And let's get in the Sherman out of their hand. So Sherman has a very ugly 16-11 record, and he's... Four and ten in the UFC. That's right. Four and ten in the UFC, and he's still uh they're still keeping him around, I guess. So he's coming off the decision loss to Waldo Cortez Acosta at the end of last year. And yeah, I mean, in his 16 wins, he has 15 knockouts, so he does have that knockout ability, but he's been knocked out four times himself and submitted twice. So he's pretty much getting finished most times he loses. And he's on his third UFC stint, but uh he just kind of keeps getting brought around. And he doesn't look good versus anyone in the UFC caliber. He pretty much only wins against guys who shouldn't be in the UFC. I mean, he has decent footwork. He has decent speed uh, with good takedown defense. But, I mean, he's 1-5 in, in his last six. So, yeah, how I see this fight playing out. I mean, Chase is very beatable here. There's a reason Williams took this fight in short notice after uh, Chase Sherman's original uh, opponent, Chris Barnett, backed out uh, two weeks ago. But, yeah, the, the UFC loves uh, Chase Sherman here. I mean, even though he's a... He's a loser and loses a lot. Uh, he'll pretty much fight anyone. He'll take a lot of fights on short notice. And the UFC appreciates that because obviously people back out of fights and they need a short notice fighter. So he does them a, a lot of favors. I mean, Williams, I see here, will just obviously wear Sherman down like other fighters have. And he'll probably get a lot of takedowns like he has in previous fights versus better wrestlers. I mean, Sherman's been, uh, he's been out of the UFC. Uh, he was out of the UFC four fights ago, but... They did him a, he did him a favor by fighting Alexander Romanov, so pretty much they gave him a new contract. So Sherman shouldn't even be the UFC at this point, really. Just, I mean, just he's only in the UFC just because he took that short uh, short fight notice. Like, I don't trust Sherman here unless he's fighting someone who's not UFC caliber, and I think Carl Williams is UFC caliber here. I think he'll keep climbing up the rankings. I mean, like I said, plus Williams out-wrestled a former Penn State wrestler on, on, the, on the dating one like, contender series. If a Penn State guy can't beat this wrestler, I don't see Sherman being able to like, avoid the takedowns. I'm going with Carl Williams by a third round knockout or a pretty boring decision win. I'll go with third round knockout, ground and pound. I think this is the lowest level of UFC heavyweight fights, and it's even boring just to make a prediction here, honestly. But yeah, uh, Carl Williams, uh, third round uh, ground and pound and knockout. I think he just wears on Chase Sherman and takes him down and ends up actually getting the knockout eventually. And Sherman will, ju Sherman will just be tired. Now, moving on to this uh, 
Second uh, middle prelim, we got a middleweight fight, a 185-pound Gerald Mirshar GM3 taking on Joe Pfeiffer. Now, I'll start off with GM3, uh, one of the best veterans of the game. He's 35 and 15. You know, he has 50 pro fights. That's so impressive. He's 10 and, 10 and 7 in the UFC, coming off the third round submission over Bruno Silva. I didn't understand that fight with where GM3 beat Bruno Silva because Alex Pereira, you know, the current middleweight champ, Alex Pereira went to a decision with Bruno Silva and couldn't drop him once. Meanwhile, Gerald GM3 Mirshar, the grappler, was able to drop Bruno Silva and do arguably better in the boxing than the professional kickboxer did against Bruno Silva. I think that's just very interesting. Like, like UFC math make no, makes no sense. You can't compare fights. It's just so hard. But yeah, I mean, GM3 is on probably the biggest tear of his career. He's 4-1 and one in his last five fights. And he's he's very much aging, but I mean, you know, he's reaching a high point in his career. He's 35 years old. And he stands 6-1 with a 77-inch reach. And of his uh, 35 wins, he has 33 wins by uh, by finish. So he's definitely a finisher here with only two decision wins in his career. And he's probably the best grappler at 185, uh, maybe in the UFC. I would, I'd maybe say that. And yeah, he, I mean, uh, among his uh, 10 wins in the UFC, you know, he has nine submissions and one knockout. So all of his wins are by finish, which is super impressive. And then we got Joe Pfeiffer on the other hand. I don't have a lot to say about him because he's still very new to the game. So he's 10 and 2, uh, just come off uh, his UFC debut. So he's 1 0 in the UFC. And that uh, debut was a first round knockout over uh, Alon Amadowski. I mean, it wasn't that impressive win because Amadowski was on his way out of the UFC anyway, but still a win in the UFC. And Pfeiffer is very young. He's 26 years old, so, you know, nine years younger. And he's 6'2 with a 75 inch reach. And Pfeiffer is also a Dana White Contender Series alum. And he's coming off his second uh, chance on the, on the Contender Series. The first time he snapped his arm, so I would, I would excuse that loss. But this guy is scary. I mean, he has seven knockouts, two submissions. He's uh, pretty scary in the boxing. Like, I think GM3 is going to try to avoid that, uh, the boxing as much as he can in this fight even though GM3 looked better in his last fight. But yeah, uh, Joe Pfeiffer, I mean, he has the way better striking here, and he's just going to be a lot more powerful. I mean, I, I love Gerald Mercer. He's one of my favorite fighters. Like, I, I love watching because that's where he's always an underdog, and he finds a way to pull it out. He's He has a lot of comeback wins. I don't know if that will happen here. I mean, just his grappling is so impressive, but he lacks that offensive wrestling to get it there. Like, It's always so frustrating to watch the fighters who... You know, like they're so good at uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but they can't take a person down to get even get it on the ground. Like, it's just it's so unfortunate to watch sometimes. But yeah, uh, I think the only way I see uh, GM3 winning against Pfeiffer here is shooting a dig down and, uh, you know, winning on the ground. But uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I think Pfeiffer plays it smart here. I, I think one of uh, trying to keep the fight and the kickboxing as much as he can. Uh, I don't think Pfeiffer is necessarily like guaranteed to knock out uh, Gerald Mercer. I, mean, I think a lot of people are saying that, but I mean, ever since Gerald Mercer got knocked out uh, in back-to-back -back first rounds in 2020, it feels like his chin's almost evolved, and he actually has almost better durability than ever. I mean, he hasn't been wobbled since uh, 2020 in his last, you know, five fights. So that's pretty impressive. Something to note, and uh, yeah, just the fact that. Uh, he got knocked up. But the fact that GM3 got knocked out by Hamzat Chemaev, who's not known as like a power puncher with one punch, that was kind of concerning at the time. But considering he didn't get knocked out by Bruno Silva in his last fight, I'd, I'd argue Bruno Silva is probably like a top five power puncher in this division. So yeah, uh, GM3's chin is definitely there. I, I wouldn't uh, agree with the rest of the crowd saying that he'll get knocked out here. I do like Pfeiffer to win here. I think he'll win uh, most of the minutes of the fight. Uh, but I think it'll happen by a decision. So yeah, I'll go with like a Joe Pfeiffer... 29 28 maybe a 30 27 decision but i definitely think pyfer will win this fight so my uh this is my fourth prelim fight and my very first strawweight women's fight so i'm really excited about this i haven't been able to break down a 115 fight yet on the show after this is finally after three ufc cards are broken down i finally get a women's strawweight fight uh they don't seem to put a lot of these fights out this year and the division is pretty small too which makes sense but yeah, we got number 10, Michelle Waterson Gomez taking on number 15, Luana Panejo. I'll start out with Gomez. So uh, Michelle, she's 18 and 10. It's kind of a unattractive record, but she has a lot of fights in the UFC. She's six, six and six in the UFC, but she's unfortunately one and four in her last five. She started out really well in the UFC, but just has kind of 
declined as of late as she's aged. And she's come with a submission loss in the second round to Amanda Lamoche. And yeah, so like I said, she's aging. She's almost 38 years old. And she stands 5'3 with a 62-inch reach. And I mean, she's like I said, she used to be a top contender in this division. But at this point, being 1-4 and four and kind of falling down to the ranked division of the top 15, she's definitely like a gatekeeper of this division at this point. You know, she's kind of like, if you can beat her, you're probably legit. But it's not like anyone could beat her. You have to probably be like a ranked fighter or kind of be like a legit fighter yourself to be able to beat her. So like I said, yeah, she's old and declining, but I think she's still pretty good. I mean, her karate is awesome as usual, and her wrestling is always above average. I mean, she can get takedowns in fights. I mean, like even in her last loss, like she looked good versus Amanda Lamoche. Like she, I think she won that first round. She looked better in that first round. I mean, then she shot the takedown in the second round and got uh, stuck in the guillotine choke. But uh, yeah, like she looked better for most of that fight until she lost pretty much. Like I know you can say that for a lot of fighters, but it's not like she looked bad in the, in the submission loss. You know what I mean? She looked competitive versus Lamoche, who's a man. Lamoche is, you know, she got a knocked out win over uh, Marina Rodriguez after that fight. And now Lamoche, you know, top three in the division, top four. So yes, yeah, so that's not a bad loss. And the fact she looked good versus her was pretty promising. And we got Luana on the other hand. She has a very impressive record and very much on the come up in her career, entering her prime. She is 10 and 1, 2 0 in the UFC, coming off the decision win over Sam Hughes. And Luana, she's only 30 years old, so she has that uh, age advantage. And she's also only 5'2 with a 62 inch reach. So Luana, uh, among the women's division, she's a she has a very high woman, uh, a very high uh, finish rate among that women's division with a finish in six of her last eight fights. And she's also a former Dana White Contender Series alum, uh, where she had a first round knockout on that uh, Contender Series. And I think the big thing with her is that people aren't realizing is, yes, she is probably better than Gomez at this point in their careers with how she's, uh, you know, like on the come up and Gomez is uh, declining, but she's come off a major knee surgery. Uh, I can't remember what ligament she tore, but this was over a year ago. I mean, she hasn't fought in 17 months. I think that's something very, something to note here. So I always see this fight playing out. If this fight stays on the feet, I really like uh, Michelle Waterson Gomez to win the boxing as the underdog. Uh, I mean, Luana, Luana hasn't fought in a while. I mean, I know uh, Michelle fought almost a year ago, but Luana hasn't fought in almost a year and a half or 17 months, like I said. And Michelle is still a good fighter. Uh, I mean, she's only lost to the top 10 fighters. She's, she's one in four versus them in her last five. Like, I think a lot of fighters would be one in four against, you know, the top 10. I think this seems too soon for Luana. I think kind of like, uh, Kind of like Casey O'Neill a couple weeks ago where she was kind of getting shot up the division really fast. Like, I think it's just too soon. And I think, I think, uh, I think Michelle, if she defends, uh, if she gets a couple of takedowns, defends takedowns herself and uh, does well in the kickboxing, I think she'll have a high uh, fight IQ here. And I think Luana needs her athleticism to win these kind of fights. But like, I don't know what that'll look like after like a major knee surgery. So yeah, I'm going to go with Michelle Waterson Gomez here with a 29-28 uh, underdog uh, win uh, by decision. Maybe a split decision if like one of the rounds is very close and like two of the rounds are pretty uh, clear who's winning it. But yeah, I think it'll be a close fight. But yeah, I'm going with Michelle Waterson Gomez. I think it's too quick to just ride her off versus, uh, you know, the number 15 division. She's number 10. I mean, like I said, she's only lost to the top 10. Now moving on to the final prelim, the feature prelim prelim of the night we got the 185 middleweights taking on uh round of some major action we got uh number 14 chris curtis taking on number 15 kelvin gaslam so we'll start out with curtis curtis is 39 he has a very impressive veteran record you know with 39 fights and he's four and one in the ufc in only 17 months in the promotion so a lot of fights in a pretty short amount of time and he's coming off the second round knockout in december over joaquin buckley it was a very impressive uh, performance where he was getting outstruck most of the fight, but then he was able to find the knockout blow. So Curtis is aging, but uh, I think he's very much in his prime. He just seems to be one of those fighters who kind of found entered his prime late. He's 35 years old, 5'10", with a 76-inch reach. And yeah, I mean, he has knockouts over a lot of uh, impressive guys who are just, uh, just outside of the rankings or in the rankings. You know, he has the knockout over Joaquin Buckley, Brendan Allen, and he had Phil Hawes in his UFC debut. He, he knocked out Andre Fialu in uh, the PFL. I mean, he's one of the best counter strikers uh, in the world in the division uh, with insane power. I mean, he has 17 career knockouts by no or 17 career wins by knockout. So you know he has that knockout ability. 
and only one win by sub. So, you know, he just mainly uh, prefers the boxing. And Chris Curtis, when he uh, came into the UFC, he's kind of notorious for having six MMA wins in 2021. Like he's fought six times in that year. That's so impressive. And he won all of them. And then he's also notorious for going three and one in his first nine fights in the UFC. I think he came in in November and by July here he had uh, four fights and three wins. So then we have uh, Kelvin Gastelum. Kelvin Gastelum is 17 and eight. And he has a uh, one no contest for uh, an unfortunate uh, fight where he did win, but he tested positive for marijuana afterwards. And Gastelum was 11 and eight, 11 and eight in the UFC. Uh, one and five in the last six, coming out the fifth round loss to Jared Kinnan here. And yeah, uh, Gaslam, he's the former winner of the Ultimate Fighter, and he challenged for the interim uh, middleweight belt versus Israel Adesanya back in 2019. Yeah, Gaslam, I mean, uh, he's impressively never been knocked out, which is huge, but he is on a bad streak right now. I mean, he, he has terrible output. I don't think he mixes in his wrestling enough. He has very poor IQ at times. He's one of the most skilled guys in the world, but I feel like he doesn't reach his full ability, and it's always kind of hard to watch. So looking at this fight, I, I think Gaslam could be one of the most talented uh, fighters uh, on the planet, but it's just not there right now, guys. Like He honestly looks small in this division at times, and he'd probably benefit dropping him down to 170. I mean, honestly, both these fighters would probably benefit going down to 170. But yeah, like Gaslam's missed weight multiple times, and... I don't feel like he's dedicated to the sport as much as some of these other guys who want to be champion. Meanwhile, we have Chris Curtis. Like I said, he's enjoying the best point in his career right now. Uh, I mean, it took him a while to get here to the UFC, so I, I don't think he's taking it for granted. You know, like he, he had 30 plus fights before he actually came to the UFC. He's very much a grinder. And yeah, I, I think Chris Curtis is uh, going to be the best boxer in this fight. Like, I think Prime versus Prime, Gaslam probably wins this fight. But we haven't seen Prime Gaslam in a long time. Both these guys are pretty small for the division, like I said. So, but I think Curse will have uh, that power advantage still. I think uh, Curse will probably land more damage throughout the fight. I would say, and it'll probably wear on Gaslam. You'll be able to see it on the face. You know, like he won't necessarily. I don't think he's gonna knock out Gaslam because no one's ever knocked him out. And there's been way better guys who haven't been able to knock him out. But uh, yeah, I think the judges will be able to see the inflicted uh, damage on Gaslam's face and. You know, Curtis, like in his last couple of fights, I've noticed he checks a lot of strikes. He never actually gets hit in the face that cleanly. He He's very good at timing, and he he's probably one of the best defensive strikers in the world. Yeah, so, and then also the fact that Gaslam needs to mix in wrestling usually to win the fight, but Chris Curtis has some of the best takedown defense I've ever seen. Like in his uh, six UFC fights, or sorry, five UFC fights, he hasn't been taken down yet. I think that's something uh, big to note. I think Gaston will probably struggle to take this uh, fight to the floor because of that uh, takedown defense. And I'm going Chris Curtis by a 28, 20, or 29 and 28 decision as the underdog. And I'm not sure why he's the underdog because Gaston's, you know, coming off almost a two year layoff and one in five in his last six. It's, it's a horrible uh, declining uh, stretch he's in. Now, moving on to the main card, we got uh, it at, it's at seven o'clock Pacific time for UFC 287. So it's kicking it off. We got a bantamweight, one thirty-five pound fight between Raúl Ro Rosas Jr. and Christian Rodriguez. So Raúl, he's seven and zero, one and zero in the UFC, and he's come he's come off uh, the three minute rear naked choke over Jay Perrin. So thing with Raúl, he's also a Dana White contender series alumni from twenty twenty two, and he's in a very exciting fighter. And a lot of people already know him, even though he's only has one fight in the UFC because he's the youngest UFC fighter of all time. And the youngest, youngest UFC fighter to ever get a win. And he's only 18 and a half. He's actually still a senior in high school, which is insane. This this dude is going to classes as a, as a high schooler and fighting in the UFC as a full-time job. And uh, yeah, I mean, when he was on, when he was on, on the uh, Dana White Contender Series uh, last, I believe it was last October, he was still 17 years old when he fought on it. And he actually had to have his parents sign like a permission slip to be able to fight. I think that's one of the craziest things I've ever seen on a headline. And uh, Raul is tall for the division. He's 5'9 with a 67-inch reach. And inside his seven fights, so he has 17 minutes of cage time in those seven fights, so obviously he has a lot of finishes. And then among those 17 minutes, he's had control time for 14 minutes. I think that's an insane stat. So 
only three minutes in the fight. He pretty much has, hasn't been on top of the opponent. He's been on top of the opponent or has some sort of control on their back or something for 14 minutes. That's an impressive uh, feature. And then, yeah, uh, he has five submissions in his career, one knockout. He's a crazy grappler, but the surprising thing is that he actually has a striking background, so he's very well-rounded. I think he's probably going to end up setting a lot of records in the UFC just because of his age, and he's only 18 and a half right now. I mean, and uh, because I think he's only he's still five years younger than the youngest uh, champ ever, which was John Jones when he won it at uh, 23 years and eight months. So, I mean... Raul has still has five years. You know, you're talking 10, 11, 12 fights were to get better. 10 fights is more than enough people to, you know, become champ in the, the UFC. So Raul could break that record of the youngest champ ever if he keeps, uh, you know, staying undefeated and keeping uh, improving every fight. So we had Rodriguez. Rodriguez is 8-1, and 1-1 one. One and one in the UFC. Coming off the first round submission over Josh Weems. Uh, Rodriguez's only loss is to uh, JSP. So uh, I will, uh, what's the name, JSP Jonathan Pierce. I will excuse that loss because uh, Jonathan Pierce is now ranked in the Bantamweight. So, you know, that's a pretty hard fight in your first fight in the UFC. So Rodriguez is also pretty young. You know, he's 25 years old. And he's also pretty tall for the division. He's 5'7", with a 71-inch reach. And among uh, Rodriguez's eight wins, he has seven fights by finish. So... These guys are both high finishers, and that will probably end up happening in this fight. So he's debuting at Bantamweight, actually. So he used to be a featherweight fighter at 145, but he's dropping down to 135. That's probably actually going to benefit him a lot because he was pretty small, actually, at 145. He looked pretty undersized, especially versus Jonathan Pierce. So it'll definitely benefit here where he's dropping down 10 pounds to a lighter weight class. And yeah, Rodriguez, I mean, he has he's a good speed. He's a slick striker. But I think his big thing that why they're matching up this fight is that he's been taken down 10 times in two UFC fights. That's a very high number. And considering that Raul has a lot of takedowns and control time, I kind of see what the UFC is doing here. So yeah, looking at this fight, Raul is going to chain wrestle here. And I don't know why he would. He's going to apply a lot of pressure early. And like we haven't seen a lot of uh, Raul striking, even though he has a striking background. But I don't think that matters here necessarily. Like, I think the fact that, like I said, Robert Rodriguez has been taken down 10 times. That's just a huge red flag for this stylistic fight. Like I, can't, like I said, I see what the UFC is doing here. The UFC wants uh, Raul, you know, as a future contender, someone who to him want to make headlines, you know, bring in pay-per-view shares, bring in pay-per-view buys by pretty much, you know, being the youngest person ever to do this, young person ever to do that. Eventually, if he's the youngest champ ever, that'll bring in a lot of uh, attention. So, yeah. They want, they want Raul as a future contender, and stylistically, this fight benefits him. So yeah, um, I see Raul getting the back, not necessarily in the first round. Maybe it starts off kind of slow, just because they're kind of feeling each other out, trying to uh, understand like uh, what what uh, each fighter is trying to do. And I see uh, Raul eventually getting the back in the second round, and then may maybe sinking in that rear naked choke. I'm calling a Raul Ruizas Jr. second round submission over Rodriguez. And moving on to the fourth to last main uh, main card fight, we got a welterweight 170 pound fight of Kevin Holland. Kevin Holland, one of my favorite fighters. Taking on Santiago Ponzinibbio. So starting out with Holland. Holland's 23, nine and one in the UFC. That one being a no contest from an accidental headbutt that they pretty much just called off the fight. And so yeah, he's 10, six and one in the UFC. And he's coming off back-to-back -back finished losses at the end of 2022. That's really hard to see. He lost in September to Hamzat Chemaev by a uh, first-round submission. And then he lost in December to Stephen Wonderboy Thompson by a fourth-round doctor stoppage. Not a doctor stoppage. His, ref, his, uh, his, his coaches called the fight after the fourth round. But it probably would have been a doctor stoppage anyway because he had a broken hand. But yeah, uh, still only 30 years old. And the fact he's only 30 years old and already has 17 fights in the UFC is pretty impressive. And those 17 fights come in, what is that? Only four years and eight months. That's pretty impressive. So let's say, I mean, five years, 17 fights. This dude's pretty much fighting six six times a year. That's, that's uh, probably the most active fighter in the UFC. So Kevin Holland's 6'3 at welterweight, which is the tallest active welterweight. And he also has the Longest reach among all active welterweights at 81 inches, which is significant. 
and 19 of his wins, 19 of his 23 wins come by stoppage, so he is definitely a finisher. So Holland's style, he's definitely a kung fu kickboxer. He has pretty impressive offensive grappling with the you know sneaky submissions. And like I said, he's one of the most active and exciting fighters on the roster. A lot of UFC fans like Holland for a reason. They get to see him fight a lot. And he always puts on a really entertaining show. And moving on to Ponzinibbio. He's, Ponzinibbio is also a very exciting fighter. He's 30 and 6, so he has a very uh, long veteran career, you know, with 36 fights. And he's 11 and 5 in the UFC. Coming off the third round knockout over Alex Morano. I do want to point out Alex Morano looked better for most of that fight. And Alex Morano was coming into that fight on short notice at a it was at a catch weight so it was not at 170 i believe it was at 180 so yeah that knockout over alex morono in the third round wasn't super impressive considering he was losing most of the fight to a guy in short notice and a guy who was lower down in the rankings but yeah uh he has an impressive record in the fc but he's two and three in his last five so he's definitely on the on the decline he's an aging 36 years old and he stands six feet even with a 73 inch reach which that's a major uh reach disadvantage there i'll go into that in a second so ponza nibio he's primarily a kickboxer with 16 knockouts and he has zero submissions in the ufc so i don't think him i don't see him being a threat on the mat in this fight and uh his striking has pretty much declined since uh he got knocked out by Li Ji lang in 2021 pretty much he'd only ever been knocked out once in his career or i think twice in his career and he had pretty good durability but Li Ji lang pretty much snatched his durability from him in 2021 when he knocked him out in the first round. So looking at this fight, Holland with that 81 inch reach, he has an eight inch reach advantage. Like at that eight inch uh, advantage is huge here. Like I anticipate he'll know how to use that advantage too. Cause some fighters don't necessarily know how to use that reach advantage sometimes in fights. Sometimes they're, uh, sometimes if you just have like a two or three reach advantage or inch reach advantage, you just, uh, you don't actually see guys using it. But then someone like Holland, Holland's a skilled enough high IQ fighter to be able to know how to use that as a tool. And the, the big thing with Holland is Holland could have wrestled more in his last fight where he lost, but he chose to strike with Wonder, Wonder Boy because Wonder Boy is a striker and he, was, he kind of had like an ego there where he wanted to outstrike the striker but ended up costing him the fight. So, I mean, I, I excused the Hamza loss before that back in September because he wasn't even supposed to fight Hamza. He was pretty much doing the the UFC a favor, you know, on short notice when uh you know guys on the UFC pay per view card missed weight and they had to scram a bunch of fights and pretty much take three fights and make them the three new fights and realign all the fighters. So uh, Holland did the UFC a favor there. So I'll, I'll excuse that fight. He wasn't training for wrestling, you know, for eight weeks before he fought. And uh, yeah, I think Holland always has the wrestling in his back pocket, like I said, but. I don't think we'll even necessarily need it here because he'll, he'll be able to outbox Ponzinibbio. I think Holland should win on the feet here against, you know, like an aging Ponzinibbio. I do think if it gets too competitive on the feet or where Ponzinibbio maybe lands like a couple uh damaging strikes, I think uh, Holland knows how to take it to the ground and only try to do that in this fight. Because Holland's lost last two fights too, I think he'll try to do all he can, all it takes to win this fight. He'll have less of an ego and he'll do, you know, he'll mix in the wrestling, the grappling in order to do all, like, take what, do whatever it takes to win this fight. I think he's not, I think he's too dumb, uh, too smart of a fighter pretty much to not win here. So, yeah, um, I think Holland eventually drops Ponzinibbio on the feet. I think maybe like late in the fight because, you know, Holland's not like a one punch knockout fighter. So, I think he drops Ponzinibbio in the third round. I think he has like a little bit of like a club and sub where he knocks him, pounces on him, and he latches up like a nasty guillotine or dart stroke. Uh, I mean, it, this fight could easily go to the scorecards because both these guys are pretty durable and it's only a three-round fight, but I think Holland will definitely wear on him. So I'm going with the Kevin Holland third round. Uh, let's go with third round dart stroke. And moving on to the future fight, we have a Bantamweight. We got some Bantamweight 135 action. I'm really excited about this fight. We have number six, Rob Font, taking on number 12, Adrian uh, Yanez. So starting out, I have a little bit of a rant here, you guys. So Ricky Simone, who's in the band and weight division as well, who's at number 10, he fights out of Vancouver, Washington, and he's on a five-fight win streak. And he's 10-2 and two in the UFC, which 10-2 and two in the UFC is a very impressive record when you're fighting the best of the best. So Ricky's beaten number 12, Rafael Sansao. 
And then Ricky himself got got pushed to number 12. You know, he got that ranking because he beat number 12. Then they made him fight back and fight number 14, Jack Shore, who was a 16 and 0 prospect, a very impressive prospect. Then he derailed that hype train of Jack Shore and beat the number 14 fire by a second round uh, head and arm triangle submission last July. And then you think surely he'd probably get like a someone ranked high, pretty high up in the rankings after beating two w- ranked wins, right? You know, being number 12 and 14, you should surely get someone near like the top five, maybe the top seven. Nope. Ricky uh, Simone gets Song Dong next month. Like credit to you, I love Song Dong and Song is a great fighter. But really UFC? Like Ricky really also has a win over the current number one contender, Marab Walsh, really back in 2018. So then... Yeah, you, you see his two ranked wins. So on the other hand, you have Yanez in this fight, who's 5-0 in the UFC, which is impressive, but they're all lower-level competition. They're all guys who aren't ranked. And he knocked out Victor Rodriguez, Gustavo Lopez, Randy Costa, and then his last fight, he knocked out Tony Kelly. None of these guys are even in the UFC anymore. And none of them are even close to being the top fit team when he beat them. Not to mention Ricky Simone would probably kill all those guys too in the cage. Like the only thing, the only guy, uh, impressive guy, uh, Yanez has beat is uh, Davy Grant, and it was a split decision. Uh, and I, it was a split decision by the judge, and I arguably think Grant won that fight. So yeah, like uh, Yanez's only uh, quality win is it's a controversial one in my opinion. Like uh, when you look at Ricky Simone, you know he's beating, you know Jack Shore, Brian Kelly, her. Ronnie Yaha, you know, like Montel Jackson, uh, back in 2018, like I said, Rob Walsh, really. I don't see Inez fighting that co- level of competition. You know, he's not, he's fighting the non-ranked guys. But then you, after Inez, you know, goes five and zero against non-ranked guys, he got the number twelve spot. Meanwhile, Ricky Simone had to beat number twelve just to get the number twelve spot. It doesn't make sense. Like I know that the UFC tries to shoot up, you know, the popular guys up the rankings, but. I feel like Inez needs to pay his dues and be a top 15 guy before he gets number six. You know, Rob Font's number six in this fight. He's getting number six guy before he beat anyone in the top 15 rankings. Like Ricky Simone has beaten two top 15 guys and he gets Song Dong, who's number eight next month. That doesn't make sense. Why wouldn't Ricky Simone get number six or someone higher than that? And if Inez and Simone both win their next fights, then Inez will probably be number six and Simone will be at like seven or eight. But... Simone would have beaten top three, top three, top fifteen opponents compared to Inez's only having only have, having one fight. Like I'm done with the rant, and I know I'm biased, obviously, because Ricky Simone is my favorite fighter, and he went to the same high school as uh, ten years before me in Vancouver, Washington. But yeah, it's just it's dumb that it feels like Ricky Simone only climbs one or two spots in the rankings after every fight, but then Inez gets the jump, you know, nine spots in the rankings versus the number six contender off of a non-ranked win. My rant is over. Let's move on to the fight, you guys. So we got the 135-pound fight. Number 6, Rob Font, taking on number 12, Adrian Yunez. So Font, he's 19-6, and 9-5 in the UFC, coming off back-to-back decision wins over uh, Marlon Chito Vera. Or sorry, back-to-back decision losses, my bad, over from Marlon Chito Vera and Jose Aldo. Font is very much aging for the division. 35 years old is pretty, is pretty old for the lighter, uh, you know, lighter weight divisions. And he's 5'8", which is pretty tall for the division with a 72-inch reach. Uh, Fonts has an impressive career where he's never been knocked out, but he's been in a lot of brawls. I mean, like last fight, distributed his incredible chin, even though he had been dropped multiple times, uh, pretty much once every round almost. I mean, his output is ridiculous. Uh, versus Marlon Vera in his last fight, he landed over 250 significant strikes in a five-round fight. And yeah, like uh, last fight, last his last three fights are all highly technical fights, and they're all main event fights, so... Font's uh, used to the spotlight and he's used to going uh, to the long rounds. He has great durability. So going to back to Yanez, he's 16-3. and three, Like I said, 5-0 and in the UFC with those four knockouts versus bums. And he's coming off the first round knockout over Tony Kelly 10 months ago. And Yanez is pretty young. He's 29 years old. And he's 5'7 with a 70-inch reach. Now, Yanez's uh, style is, is pretty entertaining to watch. He's clean boxing with very fast hands. He doesn't really grapple at all. Uh, I mean, he's never been finished either. So I think this may have really uh, highly technical and pretty entertaining fight. Though uh, Inez does have a questionable gas tank where I've noticed in a couple of his UFC fights, he looks, you know, has way faster pace and 
He looks way more incredible in the first round. Then he kind of slows out in the second and third, which I kind of worry about that versus, you know, higher competition. So looking at this fight, this is honestly the toughest pick on the card to make. I very much could see either fighter winning. I think the fact that neither fighter has been knocked out kind of makes this like a tricky pick to make. And they're both just, they're both very similar fighters. It's like Rob Font's the older version of Inez, and Inez is what Rob Font used to be when he was in his prime. But yeah, one's just way younger, and that's Inez. I think you have to look at that. Even though I just went on my rant about Inez, you know, not deserving this fight, I can't say he's not going to win this fight. I think the UFC kind of gave him like a, you know, like a stylistic advantage here, and they, the UFC wants to shoot him up the rankings so i kind of see what the ufc is doing here kind of similar to raul rosas but raul fought cool with this fight so it's definitely a lot closer than the raul Ro rosas fight starting off the pay-per-view card so i am slightly concerned about font because he took so much damage versus aldo and vera like you know in that vera fight he had you know, probably a broken orbital bone uh maybe a little bit of like a damaged skull maybe had a broken jaw he, he had a very messed up face after that fight and i think you can't just like brush that away i think that's uh something to be very alarmed about going in the future i don't think he's necessarily gonna be able to take another fight like that so i mean i am encouraged though he was winning most of the fight versus vera but he would get dropped in the rounds that ultimately lose him the round so he was out striking him for most of the fight but the damage was wearing on him more but i think also a year off is a little bit worrying it seems like it should be a clear pick for the younger guy in Inez, but He's also, like I said, he's also getting shot up to the division really quickly. I think this, is, like I said, I think this would be a really close fight. I can honestly see it going anyway. I think it reaches the scorecards. Like, I think a lot of people think someone can get knocked out for the first time here, but I think it reaches the scorecards because these guys are both so durable and they're also probably, they're both going to be kind of timid of each other too. Um, I think it'll be close. I guess I'll, I guess I'll side with Giannis here. Uh, he's just, he's going to be the way uh, younger and, He's gonna be the younger fighter, and he's just entering his prime, being only 29, versus you know, Fonts being 35 and kind of on his way out. I almost I wouldn't totally rule out the possibility of Giannis getting gassed out here and Font landing something late. Maybe maybe Font, maybe like Giannis wins the first round, loses the second and third. I just think I trust Giannis more likely to win two rounds. In all likelihood, yeah, like I, I think Giannis will look quicker and he'll probably drop a lot more feints than Font, and maybe he'll drop Font you know, like on the ground a couple times, maybe late in the fight, maybe early in the fight too, who knows. I just, I see Font maybe winning one round, Yanez winning two. And yeah, I'm going to go with a 29-28, Adrian Yanez uh, decision win. Now moving on to the co-main event. This is going to be a barn burner of a fight. We got a Walter Waite 170 pound fight. Number five, Gilbert Burns, former title challenger, taking on number 11, also former title challenger, Jorge Masvidal. And Jorge Masvidal is the coolest nickname in all of UFC. His nickname is Gamebred. Gamebred is like the coolest nickname, I think. Anyway, Burns is 21-5, and 14-5 and 5 in the UFC, coming off the first round submission over Neil Magny just two and a half months ago too. I believe that was in January on the Brazil uh, UFC card. The so Burns is aging, but he's still, I would say, in his prime. He's 36 years old. 5'10 with a 71 inch reach. And Burns is one of the most versatile fighters in the entire world. You know, he's a he's a former Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion out of Brazil. But he's also evolved in like a phenomenal kickboxer. It's almost like he likes he enjoys boxing more now because he's gotten so great at it that he's just he's such a deadly well-rounded fighter. It's so scary to watch him. But yeah, uh I think he's probably Turned into like a you know top ten boxer in the division, even though that's not his background. And then of course his uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is probably like still top of the division. And his last six fights have all been legendary. Burns is always a part of legendary fights, and I anticipate this will be his seventh and legendary fight in a row. On his last six fight, he has a knockout over Brazilian legend Damian Maia. He has a fifth round win over former champion Tyron Woodley. He has the knockout loss to Kamara Usman for the welterweight belt. Even though he lost that fight, he still dropped Usman in that fight, and that was one of the best fights of the year. Then he beat the legend, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. And then he lost exactly a year ago, pretty much this week, to Hamzat Chemaev in a three-round decision. I believe that fight was uh, probably the best fight of 2022, fight of the year. And that was a clear, that was the definition of 29-28 decision where Hamzat won, 
two rounds. One round was pretty close, and then Burns won won uh, the round two. But that was a that was one of the most competitive fights I've ever seen, and both guys had massive egos. Sometimes egos make fight guys. Egos make fights. And then yeah, and then in Burns' last fight, he beat Neil Magny this past January via head and arm triangle. So yeah, looking at Jorge, Jorge is very much a journeyman in the UFC. You know, he's 35 and 16. So he has a lot of losses. He's 12 and 9 in the UFC, coming off three straight losses. But to be fair, two of those losses were to former champ Kamara Usman, and one was to Colby Covington, the, the number one contender. So it's kind of a misleading record considering most fighters would lose those three fights in a row. And yeah, Jorge is even said he's near retirement. He's 38 years old, 5'11 with a 74 inch reach. Man, there are a lot of old fighters on this car. There's a lot of people like kind of in the mid 30s, late 30s, you know, kind of exiting your athletic prime. Very old card, but a lot of uh, iconic fighters too. So that kind of makes sense. You know, a lot of the older fighters have a lot of big names. So yeah, uh, Jorge's even said here he'll retire if he loses. And yeah, I, I kind of get it if he retires since he said he only wants to fight at the top when he's in the UFC uh, as of the last couple of years. And plus he'll be fighting in the UFC in Miami for the first time he's ever fought there. So, and like Jorge's from Miami and... I think that would be an awesome place to retire if he ends up losing here. But yeah, Jorge has this awesome Miami street fighting background and is a nasty brawler. He owns the fastest knockout in UFC history over Ben Askren in five seconds. He probably honestly could have been three seconds where it could have been called. The ref just could have, just ref, the ref stepped in two seconds too late. Uh, he has incredible hands. He actually has underrated wrestling, but his takedown defense is definitely one of his biggest flaws. Uh, Jorge's only been knocked out twice in his career, building like a legit case for this, the toughest fighter ever. Uh, one was way back in 2008, so I'll excuse that. And then his other knockout loss was the challenging for the belt in 2021 versus Kamara Usman. Uh, I mean, yeah, the fact that he has over 50 fights, he's only been knocked out twice is super impressive. So yeah, looking at this fight, I like Burns all the way here. I think he's the most dangerous, uh, the most dangerous he's ever been, the most dangerous form he's ever been in, evolving as a scary boxer, like I said. Uh, Jorge is going to be scared of Burns, I think. Scared of that takedown threat, and that'll be huge. I think this could easily play out like the Jorge Colby uh, five round fight that was in March a year ago. You know, uh, like where Jorge was kind of scared of the takedown threat from Colby, and then Colby ended up just uh, dominating on the feet at times as well because he had that takedown offense. Like, you know, Jorge is the better, uh, he's better on the feet naturally here and the better natural boxer, but the takedown and grappling threat from Burns will kind of like make Jorge. Kind of too overly cautious. Yeah, so pretty much if anyone sees Jorge winning here, it's probably going to be by knockout, but I don't see Burns getting knocked out right now, at least by Jorge. Like uh, these two guys, uh, like the two guys that knocked out Burns were Dan Hooker and Usman. Dan Hooker was kind of a fluke where he just caught Burns early with like a quick jab. And then Usman is just like a freak of nature. I can accept Usman can knock out Burns, but Jorge is not on that level. And Jorge hasn't been in the cage for over a year now because he's been dealing with the lawsuit case with Colby Covington. So I think that plays a huge factor here. Or he's just like not in the right mindset either right now because he's dealing with all the legal issues. I don't think Burns will have a problem getting takedowns and control time here. And I could see him potentially getting the finish, but Jorge is pretty tough. So I think these fighters make it three rounds with each other. The fact it's only three rounds is huge too. They'll have the gas tank for that. And yeah, I, I'm going to go with a Burns 30 to 27 decision. I don't think it's close. I think Burns wins all three rounds and then it goes to the scorecards and he clearly won all three rounds. Moving on to the main event of the evening for UFC 287, we have the rematch of middleweight champion Alex Poten Pereira taking on former champion Israel, the last style bender Adesanya. So Poten, he's only 7-1 MMA, 4-0 in the UFC with six career knockouts in those seven wins. And he's coming off the fifth round knockout over Israel Adesanya, and now it's the rematch. And Poten is old too, like all the all the other fighters on this card. He's 35 years old, and he's a massive 6'4 with a 79 inch reach. Now, where do I start with his resume? So Prayer only has eight fights in uh, MMA, but it's a little misleading because he has 40 kickboxing fights where he's 33 and seven. And Glory, he fought in Glory kickboxing the, that promotion. And Pereira is arguably the best kickboxer of all time. He had belts at 185 and 205, 
He's the only glory kickboxer and the first person to ever do it to have two belts at once simultaneously. I mean, and then among that glory kickboxing career, he had two wins over Israel Adesanya by decision and knockout. So pretty much he has three wins over Israel Adesanya, which was two in kickboxing, and then one, of course, in their UFC championship fight uh, last November. So I think this is the scariest looking fighter I've ever seen. He's by far the biggest guy at 185. Uh, his kickboxing is the best in the UFC, regardless of any division. And his MMA is going to keep evolving. You know, his wrestling and grappling is going to keep getting better. His dethroning of the crown versus Israel Adesanya last November was historical. And Israel Adesanya was 23-0 at middleweight before the dethroning of the crown. Looking at Adesanya, the former champ. So uh, Adesanya is 23-2, and very impressive record. 12-2 and in the UFC. And he's coming off the middleweight loss to Alex Pereira, like I said. And uh, he has a very impressive seven middleweight title fights before that fight and five middleweight title defenses. So yeah, very impressive. His only losses, two losses in MMA, are his last fight for the belt. And then uh, when he challenged for a second belt at 205 versus Jan Blahovich. So his two losses are both title fights. And I can't, I can't, I can excuse both of them. They're both hard losses. So prayers... I'm sorry, all of a sudden he's still in his prime. He's 33 years old. He's also 6'4 with an 80-inch reach. And he's probably the second greatest middleweight of all time as of now. He was going to surpass Anderson Silva probably as the greatest of all time, but last fight kind of blew it. He's probably also top five in the UFC in kickboxing regardless of weight. And I guess all of a sudden he's very elusive. He's technically gifted. He has excellent timing with an array of strikes. Uh, he's just he's, he's dominated the middleweight division for years against mainly wrestlers. And he has exactly what you do want in an ideal current champ, I guess, even though he's not a champ. He has high takedown defense and excellent kickboxing. It's kind of hard to beat guys like that. So look at this fight. This is such a great fight, you guys. I'm so excited for this. So the UFC has truly bust us with fights this spring with John Jones in early March, Edwards versus Usman three weeks ago, and then we get the quadrilogy of Potent and Style Better this weekend. And then we get Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo next month. People need to remember here that prayer is technically three and over to Adesanya, like I said, a close kickboxing decision, then a flat like kickboxing KO, and their last fight's uh, fifth round KO on the feet. I try to remind people of this. This is really important. After Israel lost for the second time in kickboxing to Pereira, he transitioned to MMA and then joined the UFC a year later uh, with an 11-0 MMA record. So when that was happening, Prayer was still fighting at the top of the world in kickboxing while Adesanya was evolving in the, in the MMA. Like Prayer transitioned to MMA in 2020, three years later, and joined the UFC at the end of 2021. But here's two, thing, two things that stand out. So Prayer was fighting kickboxers while Adesanya was pretty much kickboxing MMA fighters. Like MMA fighters are good at kickboxing, but they're not near the level of talent as, you know, glory world-class kickboxers. And the second thing, Pereira is already better in three years of MMA than compared to Adesanya's six because he won their last MMA fight in November. So at this point in time, there's another other couple things. So Pereira is just going to be the best, better, pure kickboxer because, uh, you know, Adesanya wasn't the world champion kickboxing in 2020. Pereira was. He's more fresh in that area. The edge that Adesanya has is the more years dedicated to wrestling and grappling because he's you know he's been doing MMA since 2017. But Adesanya pretty much lost that edge, the only edge he ever had here in MMA because, you know, like, Prayer proved he's already better than him in three years doing it. Another thing is that uh, Adesanya will not vastly improve in wrestling after their last fight. People act like Adesanya is going to try and wrestle Prayer more because he took him down a couple of times in the last fight, which is probably true, but he's not going to magically learn how to wrestle after 25 MMA fights. Meanwhile, Prayer, he has more improvement to make and more opportunity after only eight MMA fights. Like, I see more improvement after your 8th MMA fight versus your 25th. Your 25th, you've gone through 25 camps for wrestling. 8, you've only gone through 8. Like, I see Pereira closing a lot of MMA gaps here and a lot of wrestling gaps. And obviously, he's a better kickboxer. And training with Glover to share, he's going he's gonna to become a much better grappler. I'm definitely going to Pereira here, and I don't know why he's the underdog. I get Adesanya won most of the last fight and has 5 title defenses. But Adesanya fought a perfect fight and still couldn't win last fight. I think that's also huge. I think history repeats itself here. Maybe Adesanya can find success early, but he'll only survive for so long. Pereira will wear on 
Adesanya is slowly like last time and he'll find the late round KO. I'm calling it Alex Pereira fourth round standing TK over Israel Asani kind of like last time, but in the fourth round this time. Nothing too brutal, just a good ref referee stoppage, and Pereira defends the belt. Now closing on for the last few minutes, I'm going to go over the news of the day for you guys. So per Uri Hawani from the MMA Hour, as of like four hours ago, Alex Volkanovski versus Yair Rodriguez has been finalized as the co made event for UFC 290 in Las Vegas on July 8th. So this will be the featherweight uh, title unification fight. So Volkanovski is obviously the champ, but since he could challenge for the second belt at lightweight in February, it made sense to do an interim champion for Yair. So Yair had the beautiful triangle submission over Josh Emmett in February for the interim title. So that was the same night Volkanovski challenged for the lightweight belt where he lost. But obviously still uh, isn't the featherweight champ, and uh, he'll go back down to that, that division for his next fight. It makes sense to put them on the same night, so that way they have the same amount of rest for this July 8th fight. I definitely like Volk in this matchup, but Yair could make it tough at times. Uh, Yair just, uh, he has that knockout through it. So we'll probably end up seeing like a really high IQ fight from Volkanovski. And this is probably one of the top fights of the summer, I imagine. So I'm super pumped about this announcement. The fact is the co-main two prime mains will bring in John Jones versus Stipe Miocic as the main event. So that'll be a crazy stacked card. Now ending real quick with the final news of the day. This news is actually from last night. So Miami Dolphins star wide receiver, he says he'll probably retire after the 2025 NFL season, Tyree Kill. So people are thinking that this is kind of a big deal, but he'll be 32 and he'll have played a lot, like a ton of long NFL seasons. Like so, he says he'll finish up his contract that goes until 2025, and then he'll call it quits. That's three more seasons, obviously. You know, 2023, 2024, 2025. As long as he doesn't get hurt, you're, you're looking at another like 3,000, 4,000 receiving yards. Right now, he's at 8,300 after seven impressive NFL seasons. So he'll probably end up near like 12,000, 12,500 maybe career receiving yards. I mean, here he has a ring too, and he'll end up with like over $100 million. 100 million yeah, $100 million. So definitely a Hall of Fame career. And yeah, like in 2025, he'd already be 32, kind of out of his prime. Hall of Fame career after 10 seasons. That's pretty impressive. I think it's a smart choice. Plus, he says he's a, he's a lot of other careers he wants to like try out after the NFL. So why not do that when he has, you know, when he's still walking and has plenty of money in the Hall of Fame career? Yeah, that's everything I have for you guys this weekend. Uh, enjoy the UFC this weekend. Uh, main card start. Uh, the main card for UFC starts at, at 7 p.m. Pacific. I'm also gonna be watching the Professional Fire Elite uh, PFL tomorrow at 3:30. Uh, enjoy the final few games of the NFL of the NBA re regular season. The playoff seating will definitely be interesting. Thanks for tuning in. The Sports Takes with Dom. I'm Dominic Persinger for the Coog Radio.